Welcome to The Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. I've gotten a wonderful opportunity to work with a lot of people that are trying to fulfill their desires, to overcome obstacles, and I'm finding a common element that is a little prickly in overcoming, and that is cognitive distortions. When I teach that thought creates reality, it then becomes important as to what you are thinking and what you are believing. In our recent lecture that we read from Neville Goddard, we learned that we absolutely have full access to the God power with one condition, and that is, do we believe? But oftentimes our beliefs are shaded by these cognitive distortions. They undermine an understanding of who we are and the world around us. It takes us away from truth and leads us down rabbit holes that lead to nowhere, literally nowhere. These cognitive distortions are so prevalent, particularly when I'm reading social media and especially in politics, they are used to manipulate in a variety of ways. They are a part of the programming that lock you in to your current reality. And in order for us to really take advantage of our ability to create our reality, we must dissolve and dismantle the cognitive distortions in our lives. A distorted thought or cognitive distortion, and there are many, is an exaggerated pattern of thoughts that's not based on facts. It consequently leads you to view things more negatively than they really are. In other words, cognitive distortions are your mind convincing you to believe negative things about yourself and your world that are not necessarily true. Our thoughts have a great impact on how we feel and how we behave, and more particularly on the reality that we exist within. And when you treat these negative thoughts as facts, you may see yourself and act in a way based on faulty assumptions. Everyone falls into cognitive distortions on occasion. It's a part of the human experience. This happens particularly when we're feeling down. But if you engage too frequently in negative thoughts, your mental health can take a hit and these negative thoughts become things. They create timelines and realities in which catastrophes, sickness, and terrible accidents can occur because you locked into these negative thoughts. You can learn to identify cognitive distortions so that you'll know when your mind is playing tricks on you. And then you can reframe and redirect your thoughts so that they have less of a negative impact on your mood, behaviors, and your reality. Cognitive distortions are biased ways of thinking that cloud our judgment, they warp our perception and often lead to negative emotions and unhealthy behaviors. Understanding these distortions is crucial as it sets the foundation for positive change and personal growth. Cognitive distortions are not just abstract psychological concepts. They are lived realities that shape your everyday experience. These distorted patterns of thinking are like lenses that alter the way we see ourselves others in the world around us. They have the power to turn minor setbacks into insurmountable obstacles, fleeting thoughts into fixed beliefs, and manageable situations into overwhelming crises. The influence of cognitive distortions cannot be overstated. They have the power to hold us back, to limit our potential, and to keep us trapped in a cycle of negative thinking and self-doubt. They distort our perception of reality, leading us to interpret situation in ways that reinforce our deepest insecurities and fears. Why do we fall into these patterns of distorted thinking? Often cognitive distortions are rooted in past experiences, trauma, or learned behaviors. They are the mind's way of coping with stress and uncertainty. However, while they may provide temporary relief or a sense of control, in the long run, they do more harm than good. The good news is that we have the power to change these patterns, and I will discuss ways in which we can do that. 
I had this girl that I worked with, her name was Sarah, and she was bright, ambitious, whose dreams and potentials were kind of clouded by the deceptive power of distorted thinking. She had always been a top performer, both academically and in her burgeoning career. She was known for her diligence, her attention to detail, and her unwavering commitment to excellence. However, Sarah, like all of us, was not immune to the occasional bouts of self-doubt and negative thinking. So one fateful day, she was assigned with a high-profile project at work, something she had been eagerly anticipating for months, something that she was manifesting. This was her chance to shine, to prove her worth, and to take a significant step forward in her career. However, as the deadline approached and the pressure began to mount, she found herself entangled in a web of cognitive distortions. She started filtering out all the past successes, focusing solely on the times that she had failed in the past. And then she had relentless thoughts, I'm not good enough for this, I've never been able to do this, I'm going to mess this up. They became her constant companions. She overgeneralized every minor setback, interpreting them as evidence of her perceived incompetence. She looked at everything as proof that she couldn't do it, and she began catastrophizing the situation, convincing herself that failing this project would ruin her career and tarnish her reputation irreparably. She discounted all the positive feedback she had received in the past, allowing the negative thoughts to overshadow her accomplishments. This vortex of distorted thinking left her paralyzed by fear and self-doubt. She withdrew from her colleagues and was not able to complete the project, and she was demoted from her job. And as a result, she did not advance in her career because she had catastrophized this. And after I talked for a little bit to her, it appeared that she very easily could have done this. But she let these thoughts cloud her judgment, and this directly impacted her ability to complete this ever-important project that, if she had completed it, would have springboarded her into different places in her company, she definitely would have moved up and it would have helped her immensely. I see this all the time. I see this with people that use my affirmations. They'll use my affirmations. And then when thinking about them or talking about them with me, they will say, well, it's not true. And they'll mention these distortions. So I wanted to go over the 14 common cognitive distortions. Remember, there are many more than this, but these are patterns of thought that reinforce your negative beliefs and keep you trapped in a cycle of negative thinking and emotional turmoil. The first that I see all the time and I'm very guilty of is filtering. Filtering is a cognitive distortion where we focus solely on the negative aspects of a situation, ignoring any positive elements. It's like looking through a lens that only highlights the bad, making it difficult to see the good. For example, if you receive positive feedback at work, but also a small piece of constructive criticism, you might fixate on the criticism and disregard the praise. I do this all the time. I have a video I'm really excited about, and I'll be going through the comments, and the comments are wonderful, and everybody's being so complimentary, and one person says something terrible, like, I hated your voice, you talk too fast, you slurred your words, and all I can think about is that one negative comment even though 99% of all the other comments were positive I encountered this earlier in my life when I worked at General Motors and I had a performance review and my manager complimented me on my hard work several times going through a list of glowing things that they really enjoyed about my work and in the end they made one tiny improvement suggestion and I left that meeting feeling miserable and dwelling on that one suggestion all day long. I've seen filtering in relationships in pretty much every aspect of life. Filtering is a distorted thinking pattern where an individual focuses exclusively on negative aspects. Filtering can happen in a number of ways. First of all, selective attention. That involves the process of selective attention where the individual focuses on the negative details of a situation while the positive aspects are overlooked or dismissed. Another example of this is negative bias, where 
You view situations, people, or themselves through a pessimistic lens, which can lead to feelings of sadness, anxiety, or low self-worth. This negative bias can reinforce existing negative beliefs and attitudes, creating a vicious cycle of distorted thinking and negative emotions. Have you ever been around people and all they do is complain? Or all they do is point out the problems in the world? Even when they're real, that's all they do. They look at every politician as corrupt. They look at every salesman as manipulating. And so they always look at the lowest level for everybody they meet. I see that all the time. Another way of looking how this impacts your behavior, when someone consistently focuses on the negative, they may be less likely to take risks or pursue opportunities out of fear of failure or disappointment. They may engage in avoidance behaviors, steer clear of situations that they anticipate will have negative outcomes. The second cognitive distortion is polarization. Polarized thinking is a thinking about yourself and the world in an all or nothing way. When you engage in thoughts of black or white with no shades of gray, this type of cognitive distortion is leading you. Say your worker was a saint until they ate your sandwich. Now you cannot stand her. Or you got to be on your last test, so you've failed at being a good student, despite only ever getting A's before that. All or nothing thinking usually leads to extremely unrealistic standards for yourself and others that could affect your relationship and motivation. They set you up for failure. Say you've decided to eat healthy foods, but today you didn't have time to prepare a meal, so you eat a bacon burger. This immediately leads you to conclude that you've ruined your health routine. And so you decide to no longer try, that it's not going to work anymore. When you engage in this polarized thinking, everything is in either or or categories. And they might make you miss the complexity of most people and situations. Polarization involves seeing things in extremes. Why is it when you're following the newest event on the news that you think in the extremes? This is the end of the world. Situations are either perfect or a disaster. People are either wonderful or terrible. And outcomes are either complete successes or utter failures. This extreme thinking leaves no room for the complexity and nuance that are inherent in most situations. Polarized thinking can profoundly affect how individuals perceive themselves. They may set unrealistically high standards and then view themselves as failures when they inevitably fall short. This can lead to a negative self-image and contribute to feelings of inadequacy and low self-esteem. A lot of times politicians want you to be polarized. They want you to be polar and they speak with polaristic language. Polarization reflects a form of rigid thinking where the individual is stuck in their extreme viewpoints and unable to see alternative perspectives. This rigidity can claim one's ability to problem solve, adapt to change, and navigate life's complexities. And what I find fascinating is I'll come upon somebody that has this cognitive distortion of polarization. And then when you mention, hey, I think it would be really good if you overcame this polarization, they'll say, yeah, everybody is so rigid in their thinking. And when you delve deeper, it's everybody else in the world is wrong and I'm right. And that I am always right. And then everybody else needs to learn how to think properly. This can affect relationships, lead to unrealistic expectations and misunderstandings. If an individual views others in extreme terms, they may have difficulty seeing the good in people when they make mistakes or behave in less than ideal ways. This can strain relationships and contribute to conflict and disconnection. Overcoming this involves cognitive restructuring where you learn to recognize and challenge your polarized thoughts. You can practice viewing situations and people on a continuum rather than in absolute terms. Everything doesn't have to be dualistic. For example, instead of thinking of a work project as a complete success or failure, you might evaluate specific aspects of the project to identify what went well and what could be improved. Part of challenging polarization is learning to embrace ambiguity and uncertainty. 
Life is rarely black and white, and learning to tolerate the gray areas can lead to greater flexibility, resilience, and well-being. You can adopt graded language. Instead of using absolute terms like always or never, individuals can use more nuanced language such as sometimes or partially. This shift in language can reflect a more balanced and realistic perspective. Polarization can lead to intense emotional highs and lows as individuals swing between viewing situations in extremely positive or negative terms by challenging this distortion we can cultivate a more stable and balanced emotional state overcoming this polarization is crucial for building resilience life is full of ups and downs and being able to view setbacks as temporary and specific rather than as complete failures can contribute to a greater perseverance and a sense of agency the third major cognitive distortion is overgeneralization. When you overgeneralize something, you take an isolated negative event and turn it into a never ending pattern of loss and defeat. With overgeneralization, words like always, never, anything, nothing are frequent in your train of thought. So you see one person do one bad thing. Maybe this person is Dutch. And then you say, well, all Dutch people are bad. I see it all the time. Maybe not as obvious as that. Say you speak up at a team meeting and your suggestions are not included in the project. You leave the meeting thinking, I ruined my chances for a promotion. I never say the right thing. With overgeneralization, words like always and never and everything and nothing are frequent in your train of thought. They can manifest in your thoughts about the world and its events. You're running late for work and on your way there you hit a red light. You think, nothing ever goes my way. Then you see nothing ever going your way. Overgeneralization is incredibly important to understand. Oftentimes you'll see people making broad sweeping conclusion based on a single event or a piece of evidence. We must stop doing this. This distorted thought process can significantly affect our perception of ourself, others, and the world around us. Overgeneralization involves drawing broad conclusions from a single or limited number of events. Overgeneralization can lead to negative self-image and low self-esteem. When individuals view their mistakes or setbacks as indicative of their overall worth or abilities, they may develop a harsh critical view of themselves. This distortion can lead to negative feedback loops, where the initial overgeneralization leads to negative emotions, which in turn reinforce the distorted thinking pattern. This cycle can be difficult to break without intervention. Overgeneralization can also occur across different domains of one's life. For example, a person might have a negative experience in a social setting and conclude that they are socially inept in all situations. In relationships, overgeneralization can lead to misunderstandings and conflict. If someone believes that a friend's single act of thoughtlessness means that they are always inconsiderate and thoughtless, it can strain the relationship. You lose a friend that maybe made a single mistake. Maybe you're in a relationship and your partner makes a single mistake and then you generalize that this person's going to do this forever and you break up with them when you are perfect for each other. But you generalize that one event into something much, much worse. Part of cognitive restructuring involves seeking evidence to challenge the overgeneralized belief. This can involve on reflecting past experiences to find counterexamples that disprove the sweeping conclusion. It's very similar to catastrophic thinking, which we'll talk about in a second, where you're always looking for the worst possible outcome. The third cognitive distortion I see all the time is jumping to conclusions. When you jump to conclusions, you interpret an event or situation negatively without evidence supporting such a conclusion. And then you react to your assumption. Say your partner comes home looking serious. Instead of asking how they are, you immediately assume they're mad at you. Consequently, you keep your distance. In reality, your partner just had a bad day at work. Jumping to conclusions or mind reading is often in response to a persistent thought or concern of yours. It may have nothing to do with what they are thinking. 
I see it all the time. People think they know what others are thinking when they have no idea. After a conversation, someone might think, she didn't smile much, she must think I'm boring. Despite having no concrete proof of the other person's thoughts, then slowly, over time, they let this thought fester, and then they consistently think that this person thinks they are boring. Or an employee might believe, my boss didn't greet me this morning, he must be upset with me, without any additional information about the boss's mood or thoughts. This can lead to misunderstandings, strained relationships, negative emotions based on assumptions that may not be accurate. You may be torturing yourself over something because you've jumped to the conclusion when in fact it's not true. Another aspect of this is fortune telling, which is predicting a negative outcome for a future event, which often leads to worry and anxiety. So before a test, you might say, I'm going to fail despite being very well prepared or someone waiting for a medical test might assume the results are going to be bad. Something is seriously wrong and they worry about it and they make themselves sick. This kind of thinking can cause major anxiety. It can be very creative and prevent people from taking risks or trying new things and create a self-fulfilling prophecy where the negative expectation influences your behavior in a way that makes the negative outcome more likely. Before jumping to a conclusion, ask yourself, what is the evidence for and against my thought? This can help create a more balanced view of the situation. Consider other possible explanations or viewpoints. For example, if you think your friend is ignoring your text because they're mad at you, consider that they might just be busy or haven't seen the message yet. Ask yourself, what's the likelihood that what I'm worried about will actually happen? And has it happened before? This can help put things in perspective. Practice staying in the present moment rather than getting lost in future possibilities or assumptions about others' thoughts. So mindfulness and staying present can be very helpful if you have a tendency to jump to conclusions. Sometimes talking about your thoughts with a trusted friend or family member or therapist can provide an outside perspective and help challenge your conclusions. And if you have friends that you trust, that are willing to tell you when you're wrong, they'll tell you you're jumping to the conclusion now. Remind yourself that everyone makes mistakes and the negative outcomes are not necessary a reflection of your worth or abilities. By actively challenging and reframing thoughts associated with jumping to conclusion, you can develop a more balanced, rational way of thinking, leading to more improved emotional well-being and healthier relationships. The sixth common cognitive distortion is catastrophizing. Catastrophizing is related to jumping to conclusions. In this case, you jump to the worst possible conclusion in every scenario, no matter how improbable it is. This cognitive distortion often comes with what if questions. What if he didn't call because he got into an accident? What if she hasn't arrived because she really didn't want to spend time with me? What if I help this person and they end up betraying or abandoning me? I saw this with my mother all the time, and it was rather frightening. She would say, well, you got to be careful. There's murderers out there. Or my favorite is that she would say, be careful driving home. I was driving home from Kansas to Colorado once. She'd say, you got to be careful of the black eyes. There's just so much black ice out there. I had gone on the news and there was no reports of black ice anywhere in this long stretch of highway that I had to drive. But sure enough, I encountered black ice on my drive. I am guaranteeing that her catastrophizing of this event created that situation. But halfway through my drive, I noticed I started slipping. Black ice is something that you cannot see. Catastrophizing is a very powerful manipulatory device people will use it to manipulate you. They will tell you the worst possible event and then say, oh, I have a solution for that or I have a way of overcoming this. So be very careful when people over catastrophize, when people are telling you the worst possible event that can happen. Maybe you see somebody who has a mild pain in their chest and they immediately think, I'm having a heart attack and I'm going to die instead of considering more benign possibilities. I see it in health all the time. Or an employee makes a minor mistake on a report and assumes I'm going to get fired. 
without any indication that would be the case. This form of catastrophizing, this predictive catastrophizing, can cause intense anxiety. It can prevent individuals from taking action due to fear of the perceived impending disaster and can lead to avoidance behaviors. Another sort of example of this is magnification catastrophizing. This involves magnifying the significance or implications of an event, perceiving it as far more significant or harmful than it actually is. For example, after a social gathering, a person obsesses over a small awkward moment thinking, everyone noticed, and now they all think I'm weird and incompetent. Or a student gets a lower grade than expected on an assignment and thinks this is it. I'm going to fail the course and ruin my entire academic career. I will never be able to finish my degree. I won't be employed. All is lost. Magnification catastrophizing can lead to overwhelming emotions, distorted perception of events, and a heightened state of distress. So I call to you who's listening. Challenge your catastrophic thoughts by asking yourself, what is the evidence for and against my thought? What's the worst that could happen? How likely is it? Divide the situation into smaller parts to assess which aspects are realistic concerns and which are exaggerated. Again, practice staying in the present moment and using grounding techniques. Consider the best possible outcome, the worst possible outcome, and the most likely outcome of a situation to gain a balanced perspective. Create and use coping statements such as I can handle uncertainty or I've dealt with similar situations before. If catastrophizing is leading to avoidance, this is really important. Consider using a graded approach to gradually face and cope with a feared situation. If catastrophizing is significantly impacting your quality of life, you should get help. You should meditate. You need to do something about it because it is one of the first steps that can lead to depression, sadness, and mental health problems. The seventh cognitive distortion is personalization. Personalization is when you believe that you're responsible for events that in reality are completely or partially out of your control. This distortion often results in you feeling guilty or assigning blame without contemplating all factors involved. For example, your child has an accident and you blame yourself for allowing them to go to that party. Oftentimes, this is the ego playing a role. For instance, when somebody has a discussion with you where they criticize a certain parenting style and you take their words as an attack against your parenting style. Or if a friend is in a bad mood, someone might think, it must be because something I did or said, even if the friend's mood is unrelated to them. Personalization can also manifest as comparing yourself unfavorably to others, taking responsibility for their success. A coworker receives praise for a project, and an individual thinks, I should have done more to contribute. Their success is highlighting my inadequacy. Or believing that negative events or remarks are directed specifically at you, even when they're not. For instance, in a group setting, a general comment about the people needing to improve their work ethic is made and an individual thinks they are obviously talking about me i've been very guilty about this we have a tendency to make the world all about us it's the central character syndrome where you think that you are the central character in the play well in fact you are but not necessarily when it comes to these interactions with others at work or what's playing out in the world now you may say this contradicts with the idea that you create your reality and you're responsible for everything. I'm not telling you to remove your responsibility from the world, but I am telling you that in most cases, that insult that was said is not directed at you. It's not what you think it is. They're not talking about you. It has nothing to do with you. You must recognize what is it within your control. Understand that influence over a situation does not equate to full responsibility. Acknowledge external factors that may contribute to a situation rather than attributing everything to personal fault. Be kind to yourself and recognize that making mistakes or encountering challenges 
do not reflect on your worth as a person. Use more objective language. Instead of saying, I ruined everything, try saying, the situation didn't go as planned and there were several other contributing factors. If you're unsure whether you're personalizing a situation, ask for feedback from a trusted friend or family member and they can point it out. Oftentimes you're not even aware that you're personalizing the situation. The eighth distortion is the fallacy of fairness. We all tend to look at the world as a fair world. And we measure every behavior and situation on a scale of fairness. Finding that other people don't assign the same value of fairness to the event makes you resentful. In other words, you believe you know what's fair and what isn't, and it upsets you when other people disagree with you. The fallacy of fairness will lead you to face conflict with certain people in situations because you feel the need for everything to be fair according to your own parameters. But fairness is rarely absolute and can often be self-serving. For example, you expect your partner to come home and massage your feet. It's only fair since you spent all afternoon making them dinner. But they arrive exhausted and only want to take a bath. They believe it's fair to take a moment to relax from the day's chaos so they can pay full attention to you and enjoy your dinner instead of being distracted and tired. It is wrong to believe that everyone should be treated equally in all situations considering individual needs or circumstances. For example, to say I work just as hard as my co-worker so it's only fair that we get the same recognition and rewards. That's just not how the world works. Holding on to anger or resentment when situations do not seem fair can work against you. You could say I always help my friends when they need it, but they weren't there for me when I needed it. It's just not fair. Creating strict internal rules about how people should behave and getting upset when their rules are not followed can work against you. I've seen people, particularly at the beginning of a relationship, that get super angry about something the partner does or says, and they have this unwritten rule about fairness, and they say they're not respecting me, and it's not right what they did and what they said. And the other person may not even be aware of your internal rules about how people should behave. And then it ends up working against you and the relationship fails when it was a great relationship and it was just this cognitive distortion about the fallacy of fairness. So ask yourself if your definition of fairness is realistic and consider whether flexibility should be beneficial. Try to understand situations from others' perspectives, practice empathy, and consider their needs and circumstances. Acknowledge that life is inherently unfair at times, and focus on how you can respond constructively rather than dwelling on injustices that have been done to you. Understand your limits and communicate them effectively rather than expecting others to inherently know what is fair. In relationships and interactions, strive for compromise and mutual understanding instead of rigid rules of fairness that you apply to a situation. Shift your focus from what seems unfair to what you're grateful for in life. Holding on to feelings of resentment harms you more than others. Practice letting go and move forward. The ninth common cognitive distortion is blaming. I see this all the time. People love to blame others, events, and other things for their problems, and it creates a distortion that is very significant and affects you dramatically. Blaming refers to making others responsible for how you feel. You made me feel bad is what usually defines this cognitive distortion. However, even when others engage in hurtful behaviors, you are still in control of how you feel in most situations. The distortion comes from believing that others have power to affect your life even more so than yourself. For instance, your partner comments on your new dress and you feel upset for the rest of the day. You made me feel bad about myself by saying that, when in fact, you are the one in control about how you feel. Are you aware of this? Everything that happens in your life you are responsible for within your own sphere of influence. There's no need to blame anyone else. 
This distortion leads to a lack of accountability, it strains relationships, it hinders personal growth. Placing blame on others for one's own feelings, actions, or misfortunes is wrong. I've heard someone say, It's my team's fault I didn't finish the project on time. They didn't support me enough, so it's their fault. Attributing all the blame to yourself, even when external factors played a significant role, is wrong. Acknowledge and take responsibility for your own actions and their impact on situations. Develop empathy. Try to understand situations from others' perspectives and consider external factors that may have influenced their actions. I recommend using I statements instead of saying, you made me feel, try I feel to express your emotions without placing blame. Instead of dwelling on blame, just focus on finding a solution and moving forward. Actively challenge and reframe your thoughts that attribute blame to others without evidence. The tenth common cognitive distortion is should. Should is one of the most dangerous words that you can use. As cognitive distortions, should statements are subjective, ironclad rules you set for yourself and others without considering the specifics of a circumstance. You tell yourself that things should be a certain way with no exceptions. For example, you think people should always be on time or that someone who is independent should also be self-sufficient and never ask for help. When it comes to yourself, you might believe you should always make your bed or you should always make people laugh. You should be better, you constantly tell yourself. When things don't happen, they really depend on many factors. You feel guilty, disappointed, let down, or frustrated. You may believe you're trying to motivate yourself with these statements such as, I should go to the gym every day. However, when circumstances change, and you can't do what you should, you become angry and upset. You got out of work late and couldn't get to the gym, for example. Yeah, you should go to the gym, but you don't have time to go. Imposing rigid rules on yourself or others about how people should behave or how events should unfold is wrong. This way of thinking can lead to feelings of frustration, resentment, guilt, and disappointment when reality does not align with these strict expectations. The shoulds can apply to one's own behavior, the behavior of others, or the state of the world in general. Creating unrealistic standards for yourself is a self-imposed should that you should avoid. When you say something like, I should always get everything right. If I make a mistake, it means I'm a failure. You should not impose shoulds on others. Expect others to behave according to your own values or standards. He should know how I feel without me having to say anything, you say or if he cared about me, he would just understand. The world has imposed shoulds all around us, believing that life or situation should be a certain way. Life should always be fair. It's unacceptable when bad things happen to good people. Expecting a partner to always know what you need without communicating can lead to disappointment and conflict, and then you say, you should have done this. And then you get really angry because they should have done something. Have you got angry recently with your partner because they should have done something but they didn't? Have you evaluated your shoulds? Perhaps you believe that you should be acknowledged and praised at work and you feel undervalued when this doesn't happen. And then you sit and think about it and you get depressed about it. This distortion can be devastating. Perhaps you hold yourself to unrealistically high standards which can lead to a feeling of inadequacy and low self-esteem when you don't follow your own shoulds. The pressure of shoulds can contribute to anxiety, stress, and depression, and they become rules upon the reality that you create. So when you notice yourself using should statements, challenge them. Ask yourself if they are realistic and fair and what evidence supports or contradicts them. Replace should with prefer or would like instead of I should I would prefer if I. This language is less rigid and allows for more flexibility. Be compassionate towards others and yourself. Understand that everyone has limitations and that it's okay to fall short of ideal standards. Make your expectations more realistic and attainable. Adjust your expectations. Instead of focusing on what should have happened or what should have been done, focus on what did happen and can be learned from it. 
focus on the positive. Practice being in the moment and accepting things as they are. If the burden of shoulds is significantly impacting your well-being, when you're constantly saying, these people should be doing this, this should be happening, this person should have done that, I want you to evaluate that. And maybe, maybe you need to get help or talk to somebody, talk to a coach, become aware of it. Challenge your should statements. The 11th common distortion is emotional reasoning. We're all guilty of it. It easily happens. Emotional reasoning is a cognitive distortion where individuals interpret their emotions as facts, assuming that if they feel a certain way, it must be true. This way of thinking can lead to misinterpretations of situations and reinforce negative beliefs about yourself and others and the world. Emotional reasoning leads you to believe that the way you feel is a reflection of reality. I feel this way about the situation, hence it must be a fact. For example, you feel inadequate in a situation and it becomes, I don't belong anywhere. This cognitive distortion can lead you to believe future events depend on how you feel. You may firmly believe something bad will happen today because you woke up feeling anxious. You might also assess a random situation based on your emotional reaction. If someone says something that makes you angry, you immediately conclude that, that person is treating me poorly. Have you fallen into this distortion? Believing that because you feel a certain way, it must reflect the objective reality of a situation can be wrong. Yes, I teach that you follow your intuition and you do listen to your feelings. But if you follow your feelings 100%, you're missing other important information in making your decisions. Emotional reasoning can create a cycle where negative emotions lead to negative thoughts which in turn intensify the negative emotions. For example, feeling anxious about a social event and thinking, I'm going to embarrass myself, which increases your anxiety. This distortion often reinforces a negative self-image and contributes to low self-esteem. You feel like a failure and you think, I'm useless and can't do anything right. For instance, feeling unloved in a moment of conflict and concluding that your partner does not care about you at all which can lead to strains on your relationship because of how you feel. So when you notice yourself engaging in emotional reasoning, challenge the thought. Ask yourself if there is evidence to support or contradict your thought. Learn to observe your emotions as a neutral observer without immediately reacting to them. Understand that emotions are temporary and do not define you or your reality. What often happens is you have emotions come up that are a part of the shadow, that are a part of deep, hidden subconscious beliefs that are not accurate to what is going on, but are parts of a deep subconscious programming. And so you're feeling anxious about something for no reason, or you're feeling scared and fearful about something for no reason because of these deep subconscious beliefs. And then you think, well, I'm obviously very anxious about this, so something is terribly wrong. Learn to observe your emotions without immediately reacting to them. Try to use balanced thinking and look at situations from multiple perspectives rather than relying solely just on your emotional response, which is still important. Learn to identify and express your emotions accurately. Develop an emotional literacy. You can use positive affirmations to counteract negative thoughts that arise from emotional reasoning. That is one way to directly deprogram false beliefs that are within you that create these emotions. The twelfth common cognitive distortion is the fallacy of change. The fallacy of change has you expecting other people will change their ways to suit your expectations or needs, particularly when you pressure them enough. For example, you want your partner to focus on only on you, despite knowing that they've always been very social and value time with the friends. So every time they go out, you let them know it's not okay with you. Eventually, you know they will change their ways and want to stay home all the time. There's this belief that you can change someone that they will change based upon what you say. Believing that one's happiness or life circumstances depends on the actions and beliefs of others 
is wrong. By saying, oh, if only my spouse were more attentive, then I would be happy. Placing unrealistic expectations on others to change their fundamental characteristics or behavior. For instance, have you ever said, my friend should know that I need support right now and should be reaching out to me. And I'm so mad that they didn't reach out to me. When they may not even know about it. Attempting to coerce or manipulate others into changing their behavior to align with your own needs or desires. So you may believe if I act unhappy, maybe my partner will realize they need to spend more time with me. So you act unhappy all the time and suddenly your partner gets sick of it and they leave you. Focus on what you can control, your own thoughts, feelings, behaviors. There's no need for you to control others. Understand and accept that people have their own values, personalities, and behaviors, which may not always align with your preferences. Set realistic expectations. Learn to accept others as they are, rather than how you wish them to be. Instead of expecting others to know and meet your needs, communicate your needs clearly and directly. Concentrate on changes you can make in your own behavior and reactions to better navigate relationships and situations. Focus on self-change. Try to understand others' perspectives and why they behave the way they do instead of controlling them. If the fallacy of change is significantly impacting your relationships and well-being, consider seeking support. The 13th common cognitive distortion is global labeling. Labeling or mislabeling refers to taking a single attribute about someone and turning it into an absolute. This happens when you judge and then define yourself or others based on an isolated event. The labels assigned are usually negative and extreme. For example, you see your new teammate applying makeup before a meeting and you call them shallow, or they don't submit a report on time and you label them useless. This is an extreme form of overgeneralization that leads you to judge an action without taking the context into account. This in turn leads you to see yourself and others in ways that might not be accurate. Assigning labels to others can impact how you interact with them. This in turn could add friction to your relationships. When you assign those labels to yourself, it can hurt your self-esteem, leading you to feel insecure and anxious. Overgeneralization, as we discussed before, is just wrong. and You draw broad, generalized conclusions based on a single incident or a few incidents. When you label someone, Usually it's negative and focused on perceived faults or shortcomings. Say you see someone act selfishly in a specific situation and you label them as selfish in general. Applying global labels to yourself, often in a critical and harsh manner, can be very dangerous when you say, I am stupid. This is where you get the I am messages that are so powerful. When you use global labeling, it leads to stereotyping and unfair judgments. When we witness a driver make a mistake, you don't say all young drivers are reckless, but this sort of distortion is happening all the time. When people say the words all, every one of those, they're all alike, then you know that you've gotten to this point of global labeling. When you notice yourself applying a global label, challenge it. No matter what, ask yourself if it is based on sufficient evidence and if there are counterexamples. Use specific language instead of global labels. Describe specific behaviors. For example, instead of, I'm a failure, say, I made a mistake on this occasion. Be kind to yourself and others. Understand that everyone makes mistakes and that one incident does not define anyone. Encourage yourself to see the complexity in situations and people rather than reducing them to a single label. Make an effort to notice and appreciate positive qualities in yourself and others, and you'll start to lean less heavily on this global labeling that is so common. The 14th common cognitive distortion is always being right. And I've been guilty of this. In fact, I have definitely been guilty of every one of these distortions. And that's why I'm mentioning them to you. Because the journey I went on To uncover these distortions has helped me immensely in seeing the world in a truthful way. I don't care how smart you are, how many books that you've read. I don't care what it is. You are not always right. 
You must be willing to say I am wrong. You must be willing to admit that you do not know everything. And if you have a persistent need to prove your beliefs and opinions are correct while dismissing and not considering the perspectives of others can lead to tragic consequences. When you hold on to your own beliefs, even in the face of contradictory evidence or the viewpoint of others, this inflexibility is destroying you and the world. Oftentimes, people believe that they're always right and then they only seek out the evidence that they can find to prove that they're right. And then once they've advertised their beliefs and opinions, they can never change their mind because they will maybe be embarrassed or what, I don't know. But I see this all the time. Insisting that your approach to a project, to an idea or whatever is the only correct one despite what other alternative solutions have been presented to you will always work against you and it is absolutely wrong. When you react defensively, when one's opinions or actions are challenged and you perceive it as a personal attack, this is distortion, it's just not true. If you believe you're always right, you lack empathy and it will cause you to struggle to see or understand things from other person's perspective. Do not dismiss your partner's feelings during an argument, even if you believe them to be wrong, because it will just lead to further argument. Do you have a need for validation, seeking constant affirmation from others that your views are correct? Why do you have this view? What is the reason for it? I've seen this in relationships, in work environments, for self-perception, for mental health, you must practice humility. In knowledge that you do not have all the answers and it's okay to be wrong. Make a conscious effort to understand and validate others' perspectives, even if you do not agree with them. Embrace your mistakes. View mistakes as opportunities for learning and growth rather than threats to your self-worth. Change your mind. Be willing to change your mind and say that I was wrong. Recognize that not every situation requires you to prove that you are right. Sometimes it is more beneficial to let go and move on. Two people arguing, you will never win the argument. You will always lose. I recommend that you practice active listening. Focus on truly listening to others without formulating a response while they're speaking. Do you do this? When people are talking, you're thinking of how you're going to respond and not actively listening to what they're saying. Oftentimes you miss what they're saying. If you actively seek out feedback on your behavior, it may help. And be open to feedback that says you're wrong. Maybe in accepting this information, it will propel you to greater heights in consciousness and in your life in general. I recommend you regularly reflect on your interactions with others and consider how insisting on being right may be affecting your relationships and well-being. Cognitive distortions are prevalent everywhere, and it's something that you have to come to grips with. I've given some solutions specifically in each of these cognitive distortions of the 14 that I've mentioned. And we've repeatedly mentioned how being mindful and aware is one of the key things you can do. You can also thought journal and write down your thoughts, especially negative ones, and identify if a particular cognitive distortion is at play. Over time, when you review your thoughts that you journal, you'll start to recognize patterns and distortions in your thinking. Ask yourself questions like, what is the evidence for and against this thought? Or is there any other way to look at this situation? Replace distorted thoughts with more balanced and rational thoughts. Evaluate the accuracy of your thoughts and beliefs by checking them against facts and reality. Consider how others might view the situation to gain a more balanced perspective. Engage in actions that test the validity of your distorted thoughts. For example, if you believe you will fail at a task, try it out and see what happens. Use the results of your experiments to adjust your thoughts and beliefs. Use positive affirmations. Replace negative self-talk with positive affirmations that reinforce your strengths and beliefs. Strengthen your ability to handle stress and adversity through practices such as problem solving and stress management and resilience training. Embrace challenges as opportunities for growth. 
and learning foster a growth mindset seek support practice gratitude positivity educate yourself be open to new information that may contradict with what you believe so here are some affirmations that you can use perhaps to change your way of thinking and if you can adopt these ideas they may help say i choose to see the whole picture acknowledging both the positive and the negative i recognize and appreciate the positive aspects of situations life is full of gray areas and i embrace the complexity of different situations i accept that things can be both good and bad and i learn from every experience i take each situation on its own merit and don't make assumptions based on past experiences I understand that one event does not dictate the outcome of another. I give myself credit for my achievements and recognize my strengths. Positive experiences and qualities are valid and significant in my life. I seek evidence before drawing conclusions and remain open-minded. I take the time to gather facts before making judgments. I remain calm and grounded even in difficult situations. I focus on solutions rather than fearing the worst. I understand that not everything is about me and I don't take things personally. I recognize my role in situations, but I know that I'm not solely responsible for negative events. Life isn't always fair, but I focus on doing my best regardless. I let go of the need for fairness and choose to create my own path. I take responsibility for my part in situations and let go of blame. I understand that blaming others doesn't lead to growth or solutions. I replace should with could and empower myself to make choices. I am gentle with myself and understand that I am doing the best I can. Just because I feel something doesn't make it true, I acknowledge that my emotions are there but rely on logic and reason to guide my actions. I accept others as they are and focus on changing myself. I let go of the need for others to change for me to be happy. I see people and situations in their entirety, not just based on one aspect. I avoid labeling myself or others based on single events. I am open to being wrong and see the value in different perspectives. Being right is not as important as being understanding and compassionate. There are many other cognitive distortions. We've only gone through 14 of them. These distortions are just as important as anything else in creating your reality. If you can understand and overcome and dismantle these distortions, you will have the power to create the reality that you choose without this false distortion taking you off the path towards your true future. You can find all episodes of The Reality Revolution at therealityrevolution.com and welcome to The Reality Revolution.